The premier event for infection prevention and control is coming to San Antonio this June. APIC's annual conference brings you the latest research, innovative products, and practical knowledge to help you prevent infection. From inspiring keynotes to thought-provoking panel discussions, APIC 24 curates an extraordinary platform for knowledge exchange. Meet IPs from around the world who face the same daily challenges as you. If you work in infection prevention and control, you don't want to miss this event. Learn more and register to join us in person or virtually at annual.apic.org. You're listening to The Five Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. Hey. <laughs> Hi, it's Sylvia. And I'm Hannah. How are you doing, Hannah? I'm doing all right, Sylvia. How are, did you Have you gotten all your vaccines? Have um, you gotten your flu vaccine? I did get my flu vaccine. Um, you know, today we're going to talk about vaccinations and some of the myths that are out there. We've all heard in the news about parents and others feeling afraid of the vaccine. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, did you know we have a great guest we do. We have Patsy Stinchfield from Children's Minnesota that's going to be joining us in a little bit. But I want to share some some myths that have been kind of going around um, that I think a lot of people have probably heard of. Um, you know, first one being vaccines cause autism and SIDS, which is su- sudden infant death syndrome. That's definitely something we're going to be touching on today is that is obviously one that has spread across social media at the celebrity level, which is obviously, you know, social media is everywhere. Celebrities have a voice and people listen to what they say. And I think it's important that we really kind of yeah. get through that and, and, and sort of debunk that. Um, another one is that you know, some diseases, it's just part of childhood. Like I know I, I got chicken pox when I was a kid. A lot of people probably do. But, you know, did you know that chicken pox can lead to a very painful rash later on in life called shingles? I know my grandmother had it in her eye. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah, really, really yucky stuff. And the other thing is, um, ooh, the other thing is that people um, seem to think that others are responsible for getting their vaccine, that they don't have to do it. Kind of like the notion of, um, hey, someone else will call 911 when the fire's burning, or hey, other people are going to vote and I'm not. So uh, we're going to also talk about herd immunity and the importance of everybody uh, getting the vaccine. Great. And before we bring Patsy on, I did also want to just give a shout out to another um, an APIC member, an APIC hero, which we uh, we offer this award every year. And um, it's the Lehigh Valley Health Network in Pennsylvania. And, if, um, you know, they actually have a flu drive through. So they rent out a stadium parking lot. No, yeah, no joke. Mm -hmm. They rent out a stadium parking lot. They follow all the proper safety guidelines. They have police on staff or on site. They have all these, all types of healthcare professionals to monitor the process. But yeah, you you know, just like you would to order your Starbucks or, you know, get in line at the drive-thru for your fast food, you know, you've got different signs saying, okay, roll up your sleeve, get ready, have your form ready, and then you just... Get easy stuck and, and you're done. So if you if you are in the Lehigh area within Pennsylvania, definitely take a look at their uh, at their flu vaccine drive through because I thought that was pretty impressive. That's very cool. Something that could be replicated around the country. So who's ever out there listening, uh, check out the Lehigh Valley flu drive through. Um, yeah, the other thing I wanted to bring up, and I hope Patsy touches on this, <clears throat> is the is healthcare workers. You know, we go to the doctor, we unfortunately may have to find ourselves in a clinic or a hospital. Are the nurses, the doctors, the folks working in those healthcare facilities, are they immunized? Um, There's some studies that are showing that, believe it or not, um, healthcare workers aren't reaching 100% of vaccination. Uh, In a JAMA article, I think of 2018, uh, it was something like 37% of healthcare workers are vaccinated. Is, Is that... 
that doesn't seem right. Yeah, that's a little unnerving. For those that don't know, JAMA is the Journal of the American Medical Association. So so pretty top stuff. Yeah, uh, thanks, Hannah. Lots of acronyms. Uh, we got to be careful there. But yeah, so, um, so I hope she touches on that, the importance of our healthcare workers also getting vaccinated. All right, well, then I guess let's bring her on. We have Patty Stinchfield from Children's Hospital, Minnesota. She is the Senior Director of Infection Prevention and Control. Hi there, Patsy. Hey, hi, how are you? Doing okay. So talk to us. It's so important to get vaccinated. Can you talk to us about um, your experience with vaccines? You're at a children's hospital. Lots of parents are concerned about uh, getting their children vaccinated uh, against a number of, uh, of diseases. Can you talk a little bit about why that's important and maybe try to help folks understand um, what's myth and what's fact? Sure, sure. So first of all, I want to go back to your opening about uh, people having colds and things. I might sound a bit like a frog on a blog here, but I um, I have a cold. I'm at the end of it. I'm, you know how at the beginning of a cold, you, you sound fine, but you feel bad. And at the end of a cold, you sem- sometimes sound terrible, but you feel better. I'm at that point. I want people to know because I am an infection preventionist, I stayed home from work. And so I'm Very doing good. this call in, in privacy. So um, I wanted to just say that um, I'm so happy to be joining you on this inaugural blog here and really think that there's no other um, intervention that we do in healthcare that has saved more lives and done a better job at preventing disease, disability, death, and healthcare expenses than vaccines. And so as infection preventionists, that's our job is to prevent disease. And I think vaccines are our very, very best tool. I've been involved in vaccines since the late 80s, early 90s, when we had a nationwide measles outbreak. And we uh, had three children die in my hospital here at Children's Minnesota of measles. And I just could not understand how is how is this happening? How are children dying from a vaccine preventable disease? And it really made me want to strike out and understand a little bit more. I actually got some nurses and some interpreters and I went out into our community and did some door to door just interviewing families. And it really turned out that at the time in 1990, people were just confused about the schedule. So over that next decade, really worked on the importance of um, two things, parents bringing their kids in on the schedule, not being delayed, but also we in healthcare not having missed opportunities. And so the schedule was really that first kind of um, decade of my career in vaccines. More recently, it's really been on the topic that you bring up, which is the myths and the misunderstanding. And I think with the advent of social media, that's really taken us to new places with false information that we just are every day as infection preventionists, nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, just really needing to combat and make sure that the science and the evidence gets out there. So I'm pretty passionate about this topic and have spent basically my whole career on, on the importance of immunization. Well, thanks for that, Patsy. But just for the folks that are listening, I think it's important to point out one of the biggest myths that came about uh, based on some questionable science and research around vaccines causing autism. Wait a minute, we're not quite sure what causes autism, and the fact that there's some some questionable science suggesting that vaccines cause it is is problematic. A- am I getting that right? You are you are right, and it has really been one of the most. Uh long-lived perpetual myths that I think every day we're still trying to deal with. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of consequences to that myth. And so that started in the late 90s with Andrew Wakefield, who was a gastroenterologist in England. And he did some, um, some uh, research that would not pass any kind of ethical standards uh, there or here at the time. But looked at 12 children and um, drew blood at his child's birthday party, um, falsified some records, just really did not tell an honest story, but ended up getting his work published in The Lancet. And instead of, you know, the scientific review process, 
um, and, you know, speaking about your work in conferences, he called a press conference. And shortly thereafter, throughout England, Ireland, Wales, people were so worried that his, his theory about measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causes autism that they stopped vaccinating with MMR. And in turn, um, they had a significant measles outbreak in the early 2000s in Europe. Um, several children died of measles. It kind of settled down there, and then we saw it reemerge um, here. But now it is back. Europe is seeing um, more measles than they have in decades. They have over 41,000 cases of measles, and true to the one per thousand uh, people who get measles die of it, um, they've had over 40 deaths there. And right now, measles is emerging um, throughout the world. I think the only continent that doesn't have it is Antarctica. And it's for different reasons. When you look at Africa, they've got, you know, war and famine and public health infrastructure infrastructure decay. Same with Venezuela. They've got economic hardships. And, and so people that live in those countries are having measles because of systemic infrastructure problems, whereas Europe, the United States, and other parts of the world are really um, – sadly, listening too much to the myth um, and are choosing to not vaccinate with MMR. And I can tell you just a quick story of how this hit us at home and, and how my team here at Children's Minnesota became the APIC heroes. And this was 2017. We had over 75 cases of measles in Minnesota, and <clears throat> 65 of them were in children uh, from uh, who were Somali Minnesotans. They were all born here, but they were Somali descent. And as we explored this situation, and I personally got to talk to almost all of those parents and look at their families' immunization records, they were fully immunized against every disease except the MMR. And, and so, and Patsy, start- I'm just gonna I'm just gonna jump in here because for folks listening, just to be clear, can you can you um, tell them what MMR is for anybody out there that's not sure? Sure. Yeah, thank you. So measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Um, so one shot at, given at uh, 12 months of age and then kindergarten, that prevents three severe diseases. So the, it was the Wakefield paper that said this triple shot, as some of the parents knew it, MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, his paper was saying how that that was the, what was causing autism. That was false. Um, it, that paper was later retracted. He lost his license, et cetera. Okay, but so Mythbuster, Mythbuster. Vaccines, right, exactly. MMR, do not, we repeat, do not cause autism and could right. potentially save your children's lives. Okay, Mythbuster, Mythbuster. Thanks, Patsy. Right, Just exactly. wanted to get that you out. You got there. it. And another sort of myth that I wanted to touch on, because I think the a lot of times, you know, we rely heavily on our healthcare professionals. That's that's why so many people believed Andrew Wakefield. He had a medical license. He was published. And, you know, it's we we trust that they are doing what they can. And that also, you know, leads into the immunization of our healthcare workers and that herd immunity aspect. So, you know, another common myth is, um, and this comes from the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, is that there are children that aren't vaccinated because their parents think to themselves, oh, well, the other people around them are vaccinated, so that's okay. And I think to myself, that reminds me of sort of the voting mindset of some people of, oh, well, my vote doesn't matter, so it's, you know, I'm not going to go do it. And I think it's like, everybody needs to do their part, you know, as we, as sort of our motto is, infection prevention is everybody's business. And that's especially important for healthcare workers, whether you are in food service, you're a bedside nurse, you're the doctor, um, anybody that works in a facility. So if you could kind of touch on sort of the your policies and, and best practices around the immunization of healthcare workers. Sure. I, I think we have to remember that healthcare workers are part of the general public. <laughs> and so some of the misinformation that gets out in social media and Facebook, et cetera, 
our staff are reading as well. And so we've got to always make sure that we are educating um, all of our staff and not just assume, well, they went to medical school, they went to nursing school, and so they know that vaccines save lives, vaccines are safe and effective, vaccines are the best tool we have against disease. We have to keep making sure that we're teaching our healthcare workers. So at Children's Minnesota and many hospitals across the country, we have kind of a hard stop of if you want to work here, you have to have proof of immunity. And um, we follow the CDC healthcare professionals guidance. It's a really clear grid on the CDC website. Anybody can look it up. Um, and, and basically it's because in a children's hospital, many of our patients are too young to be immunized. So if they're less than six months of age, they can't get influenza vaccine. Um, some of them are premature babies. They're too young to start their primary series. Some of them are kids with cancer who've had chemotherapy and we've wiped out their immune memory to their own vaccines. And so our job is to cocoon them and vaccinate ourselves. It's really, really important. And I'm, I'm proud of the community that I work in that, that we really value immunizations here. So, you know, what's interesting there, too, is I've heard the expression, you know, you get vaccinated not for yourself, but for everybody around you. Would you say that's true, Patsy? Well, I think it's true, but when you look at some of the studies on this topic, healthcare workers are a little bit on the selfish side, that they answer that question with, I get vaccinated to protect myself. Okay, well, that's good because that is what you need to do. Um, But you also want to have that compassionate side that I want to protect everyone around me. I want to protect my patients, their families. I want to protect my own family and not bring an infectious disease home to my own children or my own grandparents, for example. So I think there's different reasons why people vaccinate. Hopefully, healthcare workers vaccinate because they they have uh, an evidence-based view of the world, and they know that science tells us that it is the safest and best thing we can do. To to skip vaccines is to take a risk, and we don't need to be taking risks in healthcare. Well, and we one of the things you had touched on going back to the the measles piece and the and the huge outbreak in the uh, Somali population in Minnesota is. There are so many diseases that can be prevented through infection or through um, through vaccination. I mean, you know, measles, as you noted, is a deadly disease for children. The flu, people die annually of the flu, meningitis, HPV. I know there's a stigma around HPV and, you know, getting vaccinated. That's human papillomavirus. Yes. Um, And then hepatitis. But, you know, all of these things really can be prevented. And, you know, even the studies that say, oh, there's, you know, this one was only 65 percent effective. And I think to myself, well, that's still 65 percent better than than zero, which is what you have right now by not getting the vaccine. Um, But I wanted to touch on sort of this eradication versus elimination piece, Um, you know, because I think most people immediately go to smallpox. Um, But can you touch on that a little bit about the difference between the two? Sure. So um, eradication is to completely um, rid the globe of that organism. And you mentioned smallpox, and that is our main vaccine um, preventable disease that we have, in fact, eradicated. Elimination is to reduce it in a region. So, for example, measles elimination in North America, uh, where there is no longer endemic, which means that it is circulating right within our country and coming within our country. Um, we've, we've already reached measles elimination. However, we're seeing measles cases in the United States because largely they're imported or, or brought in by airplane rides from parts of the world that are having a uh, measles outbreak, which used to be parts of Africa, parts of India. Now, if you go on vacation in Europe, you could very well come home with some souvenirs as well as some measles. So one thing I I think is important to your point about, you know, we're at this time in in, uh, vaccine history where, and it's it's an overstated phrase, but I think it's really true, which is we're victims of our own success. Our vaccines have done such a good job eliminating the diseases that you listed and a bunch of others that parents and even young clinicians haven't seen them. And so they don't feel the kind of threat of, well, how bad can measles be? Isn't that just a rash? Or how bad is Haemophilus influenza B? I heard it's a bacteria. Don't you just take antibiotics for it? 
And I think those of us who've been in healthcare a long time remember the days where we saw these terrible diseases and we had no antibiotics or we had no um, vaccines for them. And so we have parents and clinicians that maybe don't have that kind of um, sort of important view of vaccines that, that I think we all need to maintain. That's that's so important, so great. Um, and I think you've done a great job convincing our listeners that, yeah, you got to get yourself vaccinated, um, which brings us to, um, you know, we want to know what's bugging you. Um, tell us the five things, three to five things that are really bugging you, Patsy. Well, I'll stick with vaccines and I won't go broader than that because I would get in trouble if I did that. But um the, the five things, good question, that are bugging me. Well, one is I, I really feel like um, we, our, our ability to communicate science is not where it needs to be. So those of us who are pro-vaccine, and I don't say believe in vaccines because vaccines are not a religion. It's not a belief system. It's a science, which is an information and knowledge way that we think about things. We're not doing a good job at communicating to the general public to legislators, to parents, to young parents, to teenagers very well about the importance of of immunizations, what they are, how they work, why we use them. I would say our knowledge of, this is probably my second thing that bugs me, is our knowledge of basic anatomy, physiology, immunology, like how, how our body's immune systems work is so remarkable. It is so amazing. And this sense of, oh, we don't want to do so many vaccines today because that's going to overwhelm our immune system. I can almost hear our immune system laughing when people say that because the immune system is a vast ocean of, of antibodies and fighters that are, are ready and prepared. So really don't underestimate the immune system and we need to talk more about the power of the human immune system. I would say number three that bugs me is Social media is a double-edged sword. Um, We have the ability to use it and use it well and and use our messages out there, but so do the people who are anti-vaccine, and they seem to be quite prolific on social media, and it makes our job um, even harder. I would say um, a fourth one that is uh, frustrating is even healthcare professionals the fact that we have to encourage people to get their flu vaccine and encourage them to get their their on onboarding immunizations when they're coming to work in a, a children's hospital, it, it sort of makes me wonder, so why would you come into a profession where you don't want to protect yourself and protect others? And so I, I think we have work to do with our healthcare professionals of just getting it done and knowing that this is, is this is the right thing to do. And I guess I would just say last is that um, for almost all of our vaccines, we're, we're not at the highest rate that we need to be to prevent outbreaks. In fact, we're seeing some, some really dropping and measles dropped 31%. Um, our coverage with, against measles with the MMR vaccine dropped 31% last year worldwide. And so we just should buckle down and be prepared for more outbreaks. It's the most infectious virus. And so if you're going to see problems from low immunization rates, you're going to see it first with measles, and that's what's happening right now. So who knows what else is right around the corner. So those are the five things that bugged me. I hope you're going to ask me what makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to tag on to, uh, to, the, to the five things that are bugging you is that our ask for our listeners is – Check your health records, you know, make sure that you are up to date on your vaccinations, that you are vaccinating anything that's appropriate for travel. So if you're going out of the country, do your research and figure out what you need to get ahead of time. And, you know, we're coming up on the uh, on the 100th anniversary of the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic. So uh, let's kick it into gear and, uh, and get those checked in. Thank you so much, Patsy, for joining us today. I'm Hannah. I'm Sylvia. And this was the five second rule. Thanks for listening to The 5 Second Rule and doing your part to prevent infection. Because remember, infection prevention is everybody's business. To hear more 5 Second Rule episodes and learn more about how you can help, go to apic.org forward slash 5 Second Rule. The 5 Second Rule is produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology staff, including Hannah Andrews, Ricky Dana, Christine Miller, and Sylvia Cavedo. 
in partnership with Human Factor. Audio tech is Blake Alfin.